think of them as just commands. Maybe we'll even think of them as commandments. You can grow here too. <laughs> the first command that we will focus on is sit. So no matter the season, it seems I'm always running, always on the move. If I'm being honest, my mantra is just one more thing. And then after that, just one more thing, there's just one more thing. I often try to squeeze in one more activity into my already busy day. Doing one more thing or attempting to multitask, it doesn't really seem to work for me. Does it work for you? No. Here are a few no's. The result is, when I do that, I'm not even present to my present. It can leave me stressed, overwhelmed, sleep deprived. And I need to remind myself what Louis Tomlin said. If you win the rat race, you're still a rat. <laughs> How many of you can relate to that? So maybe it's time to drop out of the rat race. But society always seems to be encouraging us to do more, to multitask, or at least be really good managers of our time. There are all sorts of sayings that encourage us to be busy on the move. One of my mom's favorites was, idle hands are the devil's playground. I never knew what that meant, but I took it to heart sometimes. My mother also sometimes said to me, don't just sit there, do something. So I'd like to share a short poem that I wrote based on what my mother would tell me and uh, a short reading that I read uh, by Tich Nhat Han called Aimlessness. So this is a title with thanks to Tich Nhat Han. Don't just do something, sit there. <laughs> and this, at these six simple words, I stare. Don't just do something, sit there. Just be without judgment and don't compare. Don't just do something, simply be. No rushing, no accomplishing, no me, me, me. Just sit. Being without desire or care. Just sit. Just be. Just be aware. So it's not the, just the simple act of sitting, but what we do when we're sitting that really matters. Sit. It sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? Most of you are doing that right now. Do you know that the average American sits six to eight hours a day? If it were just that easy, we would all be enlightened. <laughs> so let's not just sit around. It's way more than sitting in front of a TV, watching the news, or in front of our computers or laptops, phones, or any other distractions that we can think of. When I say sit, I'm talking about attention, focus, receptivity. Isn't that what a dog does? Most dogs perk up and wait for the next command. We are sitting still, observing, listening, present to the sacred now that sacred now moment. Try as we might, when we sit still, thoughts, those thoughts are bound to surface to creep in. Like, how am I going to fix 
and then you say, fill in the blank. Fix my boss, my coworkers, my spouse, my kids, my friends, my finances. How am I going to fix my weight, my life? My, my, my. This is really an opportunity to examine our thoughts, but not to grasp them, not to hold on to them. This is an opportunity to become the compassionate observer. I like how Kenneth Chauvin talks about it. She says, don't bump the hook. That creates such a clear picture in my mind. Those negative, egoic, fear-filled thoughts are kind of like that fish hook. Once you bite, once we invite those thoughts to take up resonance in our mind, it can be difficult to let them go. Charles Fenimore wrote that all power has its birth in the stillness. We need to be still, to sit in the stillness and be open. So we listen. David Augsburger wrote, an open ear is the only believable sign of an open heart. As we sit in silence, Let's be open, listening. When a well-trained dog sits, it waits with anticipation for the word from its master. Let's sit with attention, with that anticipation. Okay, a squirrel moment. So about halfway through my writing this talk, I felt a bit peckish. That's British for a little bit hungry. So I opened one fortune cookie and read this, which kind of moved my mind. Fear is the dark room where negatives are developed. I know. It didn't say who wrote it, but wow. That could have been my whole talk. Fear is the dark room where negatives develop. Yes, when those fears, judgments, hurts, disappointments surface, because they will, this becomes another opportunity, the opportunity to forgive. Or I can choose to drag the heavy baggage, those hurts, a few more days, a few more weeks, a few more months, uh, maybe a few more years. That baggage only slows me down. The revealing word states that forgiveness is a process of giving up the false for the true. What is true? Truth is absolute and unchanging. Truth abides in the very core of man's being, in the very core of your being. As your subconscious, as your consciousness, excuse me, as your consciousness or awareness expands, you touch, you touch the everlasting truth. But the fact is, we can only hold one thought at a time. Thoughts of separation, hurt, unforgiveness, judgment, keep us from that truth, that truth that is ours. True forgiveness is only established through renewing the mind and body with thoughts and words of truth. It's like remembering, put it back together. Reminding, reminding ourselves of that truth. I like to look at Lord of Fillmore's life concerning the aspects of sit, speak, and heal. 
1886, yeah, that was a long time ago, Myrtle Fillmore, co-founder of Unity, was extremely ill. She wrote, I was supposed to be dying, or very close to it, of tuberculosis, a disease that was supposed to belong to my father's family. I was fearfully sick. I had all the ills of mind and body that I, I, that I could bear. Medicine and doctors ceased to give me relief, and I was in despair when I found Christianity. I think it's interesting that she mentioned TB, tuberculosis, belonged to her father's family, that she inherited it. I'd like us to think, what do we believe that has been passed down? What's in your genes, not what's in your wallet, maybe what's in your wallet, but what's in your genes that you're believing? Is it negative or good? Back to Myrtle's story. She heard a lecture by Dr. E.B. Weeks, and the one statement that stood out to her and that she carried away from the meeting was, I am a child of God, and therefore, I do not inherit sickness. In the book, One is No More, Mother of Unity, Thomas Witherspoon wrote that she chose to close herself off in a room by herself when she studied the gospel. She sat next to an empty chair and envisioned the presence of Christ sitting next to her, supporting her, encouraging her. She sat and the truth came to her. So yes, she sat, but with an open and receptive mind. That brings me to my next command, speak. Words are powerful. They have energy. The revealing words that words are the vehicles which ideas make themselves manifest. So we speak the word and it's carried through that energy and becomes manifest. When spiritual words abide in man's consciousness, the word or thought formed in intellectual and sense mind must give way to higher principles of being. Affirmations or words of truth realized in our consciousness bring the mind into the right attitude to receive light and power and guidance from spirit. <coughs> Merle wrote, Life is simply a form of energy and has to be guided and directed in man's body by his intelligence. How do we communicate intelligence? By thinking and talking, of course. When it then it flashed upon me that I might talk to the life in every part of my body. I went to all the life centers in my body and spoke words of truth to them words of strength and power, I became very watchful as to what I thought and said. That's a reminder to me to watch what I think and what I say. I'd like to share a recent experience that to me demonstrated what can happen when we're willing to first sit, become aware, mindful, and then speak whether it's out loud or not. So I recently flew back from a trip to Boston. My first inkling that this was going to be an interesting flight was the text message that informed me that my flight would be delayed for two hours. Ah, no problem there. I get to spend more time with my brother Paul and my sister <coughs> I arrived at the gate in plenty of time and sat down to wait for boarding. When a 
fire alarm went off in the airport. There were flashing lights and beeping, and that continued for 10 to 15 minutes. We were all told just to stay put until the issue was resolved. So eventually we boarded the plane. A bit late, but again, no big deal. And off we went. Smooth sailing, so to speak. Until about halfway through the flight, we hit turbulence. Buckle up. Flight attendants, take your seat, I heard. There was a young man with some challenges about three rows in front of me. Every few minutes, he yelled, he shouted. The gentleman next to me gripped the seat in front of him and curled up, doubled over. In the past, I'd probably be working on my second bar bag. <laughs> Just to be honest. But what was I doing? It felt almost surreal. I was the observer. Here I was, sitting, being present to all that was going on all around me. And also, at the same time, aware of the truth. I knew that God was in this situation because God is in every situation. I took a holy breath and I started to pray. I prayed for the young man that was distressed. I prayed for the man next to me, for the attendants, the pilots, for everyone on the plane for the plane itself. And it's hard to put into words, <coughs> but for a moment, for a short while, I felt as if we all were protected. That is the truth. An incredible peace and calm came over me. It was as if the whole plane were wrapped in light and love. It was an incredible Experience. Perhaps not as dramatic as Mark's feeling, but for me it was a life changing experience. Getting back to Myrtle, the next command is heal. By sitting, being mindful and open and speaking <coughs> words of truth, Myrtle's Elmore was healed. It didn't happen overnight. It took about two years. This took patience. The revealing word says patience is an attitude of mind characterized by poise, inner calmness, and quiet endurance, especially in the face of trying conditions. Patience has its foundation in faith and is perfected only in those who have unwavering faith in God. That doesn't happen overnight. Things come in and shake us a little, and we have to reground ourselves, re go into that stillness. And the children said this about patience. This radical form of patience takes a lot of courage. And it can transform you at the core. Instead of our hearts being coming, becoming hard when difficulties arise, patience, patience makes our heart become more genuine and loving. That is healing. To have a genuine and loving heart. To have faith in the feeling of oneness. Jesus often said, go, your faith has made you well. 
Don't get me wrong. I am far from perfect. And don't take this talk as an opportunity to judge yourself or others. That's what we call metaphysical malpractice. <laughs> I'm simply encouraging us, myself included, to sit, sit in the silence, sit in the presence, speak, speak only words of truth, truth with a capital T, truth that you are divine. When we heal our thoughts of separation, of not enoughness, that's when the healing takes place. And one more thing, fetch. Go into action. Do what you're guided to do. Feel all the joy you can. Wiggle your tail if you need to. <laughs> Be the joy. Love unconditionally. Divine. 